Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Identity is really just a story. And it, that can be great. It can give us motivation and aspiration and a sense of community. It can also really trap us and weigh us down. I just really, I'm really happy you brought that up. And I, I just encourage everyone to sort of look inward and, and understand what your story is, what your narrative is, and um, which I'm using interchangeably here, even though they're a little bit different, but uh, what that story is and really pluck out the things that are beneficial for you but then also really put a spotlight on the things that aren't beneficial, that may weigh you down and, and really make a call uh, if there's some things you can shed. Welcome back. I hope your week's been absolutely awesome so far. If you haven't listened yet to my recent conversations with personal branding coach Marina Gurgis and with founder of Goodman Lantern, Raj Goodman Anand, then after you've listened to today's conversation, go and check them out too. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Casey Berman of Leave Law Behind, where attorneys can learn to expand beyond or outright leave their current legal practice in order to start a business, create an enjoyable lifestyle and to feel cool about themselves all over again. Casey is a creative and interpersonal senior marketing and communications executive, a former lawyer and business founder with 15 plus years of market research strategy and executive communications experience in the technology, e-commerce, digital media and consumer software segments. In our conversation today, Casey talked to me about the importance of self-awareness and mindset in pursuing your dream career. We talked about the power of storytelling, and he gave us his three unique genius questions. Without further ado, then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Casey Berman. Hi. I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast from beautiful San Francisco in California, the USA, Casey Berman, who's an entrepreneur, he's a business founder, and his passion project, Leave Law Behind, helps unhappy attorneys to leave the law. So we'll um, explore that some more. I'm not sure. there's a bit of a double meaning there. I think it's, it's <laughs> probably a, all above board. So welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Casey. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. You're going to be honored. Thanks for having me. This is great. All above board when it comes to the <laughs> wall behind. <laughs> yeah. Now, Ollie Glowheed, who was our guest on episode 410 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you and he introduced us. So big hello to Oleg. Yes. He's a, Oleg's a great guy, become a very close friend of mine, and he's he's just doing great work in the world. So yeah, um, he is. Yeah. I love following his podcast too. So yeah, um, if if you haven't already discovered that, go listen into Oleg's podcast. Um, now, what's it? Remind me, what's it called? Survive, uh, survive to thrive. It's uh, overcoming odds. That's it. Uh, overcoming today odds. is yeah. his site. Yeah, brilliant. All right. Now, before we start talking all things about um, getting out of the law into alternative uh, activities, what is it that actually drives you and how does that shape what you do today? No, that's a great question. And 
what as as a little real quick background on me. I'm I'm based here in in San Francisco, California. Born and raised. Live here with my wife and two kids. I'm I'm 47 years old, so um, still feel really young, but uh, have a little experience under my belt, so I can I can refer to a, a few things here and there. And you know, for me, I run Leave Law Behind, which is a coaching practice to help unhappy attorneys leave the law. I also um, do strategy, innovation strategy work, and research with uh, Fortune 1000 companies as well. So what's great about it is I get to be an entrepreneur and I also get to pull in insights from the big companies and, and what they're dealing with. And I, it's, it's, I, I love being able to, to do a number of things. And so, you know, to your question of kind of what drives me and, and, and what's my why, um, it's been a journey. I can't say I really knew what it was from a business standpoint or a personal standpoint. But I've been able to do some some inner work. I've been able to do touchy feely stuff, mindset, and all that. Which, while we call it touchy feely and woo woo, is super important. Mm -hmm. it, it gets the mind in sort of a peak state and in the zone. And you know, for me, my why is really to. Uh, it's going to sound cheesy, but kind of to to be of service, um, to to help others. And where I choose to really do that and how I do that is is with my skills and strengths. I'm a storyteller. I connect the dots, whether it's an attorney leaving the law who is sort of facing obstacles or fear of what will my parents think or how will I make money or whether it's a Fortune 500 company who's saying, you know, how do we innovate? How do we, we've crossed the chasm, have we? How do we go here? How do we do that? How do we do a go-to-market plan? How do we reinvent ourselves? How do we deal with this digital disruption thing? Whatever it is, people learn through stories. And I and what I really focus on is helping to connect the dots and and make something murkiness kind of clear for people so they can feel confident in how they act so um that's sort of my roundabout way of saying what what i really end up doing every day whether it's entrepreneurial or or otherwise mm, yeah i love it um, the, the power of stories is uh, is uh, something that we kind of take for granted and sometimes we overlook it and forget about it huh? You really do. Hmm. Now, um, you mentioned something there along the lines that I think is kind of at the core of why you made the change from law, and that's you know people's expectations of you. And um, with with your journey out of the law, when, when did you discover that the law wasn't for you? So you did you studied law, you kind of got into a law practice and got a job and and when did you realize that this wasn't for you great question i always joke i'm a i'm a jewish kid who who didn't like blood so i didn't go to medical school i went to law <laughs> school and that's about as critically as i thought about it and i thought i was alone in just being a dummy and going to law school without thinking about it but the more that i've and i've helped hundreds of attorneys to leave the law and you realize fill in the blank that ethnicity background religion geography, mm. wherever you're from, a lot of people went into law school without just thinking about it. We, without thinking about it, we, we saw it on TV. Our parents said we were good speakers and we just sort of went. And no wonder five, 10 years in, you're saying, what am I doing? This is not a fit with my skills and strengths. I'm unhappy. I'm anxious. What takes one person 45 minutes to do takes me five hours to do. You know, you're just a disconnect. You're not, you're just out of whack. Because um, the job isn't a fit for you. And so uh, I knew that going in, I still went to law school. I made my mom and dad happy and proud. Um, I still pay my bar dues in California to this day. But and, and there is, you know, I've learned a lot. And, and as I tell lawyers when they leave the law, you're not getting rid of your past. I mean, this is a stepping stone. There's a ton of great skills that we learn in law school and as lawyers that are transferable to non-law jobs. But I knew kind of going in that practicing as a lawyer wasn't for me, um, but I just sort of did it. And and even tougher for me, I had the job all attorneys wanted. I was in-house counsel for a company called Workshare. It's still around. And, you know, early 2000s, dot-com San Francisco, dogs running around and lunch and cool offices. I mean, like out of a movie, but it was still reactive to me. I wasn't able to be creative. I was still anxious. I was still putting out fires and it just just wasn't a fit. It was a fit for other people. It wasn't wasn't a fit for me. So about five years in, I knew it earlier, but about five years in um, when I found myself kind of going 
to be an administrator. We had a little quick story. We had a an offsite. The company was based in London, and we flew over there. And there was the sales team, the biz dev team, the support team, creative team. And I, as the attorney, was I had a sticker on my hi, my name is Casey, and I was in the administrative team. And I said, that's just not for me. It is for some people. I'm not knocking it, but being called administrative, it, it was sort of the the last straw for me. And about six months later, I I left. Um, so that really hit home that that not only viscerally, but sort of optically and aesthetically, I was in the wrong place. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, there's kind of the societal expectations, and I know you know it's. I think it's across the board culturally that uh, people who get really high marks in school, the the expectation is that they either go into medicine or law, you know, right. because um, I don't know why they don't send them into rocket science or something like that. But the <laughs> the idea is that medicine and law are the studies that are the most demanding and require the smartest people. So that's um, that's the expectations of society, and and I I can't fathom how many people are probably in those professions that really are unhappy, um, and which is uh, great. But one of the things that really strikes me, and I, I get you to talk to this a little bit because I think there's a big message there for people who are in law and are perhaps looking for a change. Um, my daughter studied law, and when we were looking into all the different options she had and all the different schools she could go to. Um, and she's not a lawyer, by the way. <laughs> um, but what struck me is that the the study of law is a really all-round, like there's so much stuff that comes into that, that um, study, which gives you an all-round education. And in fact, a couple of times I came away from those open days and I thought, wow, I'd, I'd love to go to law school just to learn all the stuff that they learn there. Yeah, it's so that's right. Law school, I didn't really enjoy it. It was a it was a pressure cooker for me. I should have known, but many people did. And there were some elements that I enjoyed. Law school is can be is very theoretical. There were some philosophy of law classes I took. Um, but, and you learn a ton of great skills. Lawyers have fantastic skills. I mean, if you, if you really think about the transferable skills, they can be the adult in the room. They tell stories, they connect the dots, they can present under pressure, they can upsell. I mean, there are so many, what we call transferable skills and great skills that they have, which is why people say, well, you can do anything with a law degree. What happens, unfortunately, that no one really talks about is what they teach in law school is not near, not even close to what the practice of law is like. Hmm. The politics, the running the business, the dealing with a law firm. I mean, most of the people within in Leave Law Behind, and we've created this online coaching program and 200 some odd people in it right now, the work is just boring. There's no meaning with the client. I mean, they literally don't care. Hmm. And now they're coming out of law school with Hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt. So you don't care about what you're doing, but you're stuck. And it's not even the golden handcuffs where now you're just spending all your money. You're just paying down your debt, and you're sitting there saying, "How the heck did I did I get here?" Right. And so, law school is theoretical. The practice of law is totally different and is boring. And then the other thing is the fear and the blocker, the obstacles. And while so many of us are type A and smart and masters of the universe and so on, lawyers as well as a lot of other professionals, what happens is, is we are so programmed and conditioned for certainty. We are so programmed in, in high school and college to follow that path, that to innovate, to be an entrepreneur, to break out of the mold, to do any of that is terrifying. And it's so ironic to see these people who literally, there are people in Leave Law Behind who've argued in front of the Supreme Court, state and federal, who've argued in front of the Court of Appeals. I mean, they have been at the top and they are so afraid about going for an informational interview to learn about a new job because they feel they'll get rejected. And so those are the things, the theory in law school, the boringness of the work, and just this fear 
these blockers that so many of these lawyers have that really keeps them stuck. Hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of a sense of fear, right, um, about making the change. And I think what you've described there is not unique to people in law. It's, I think that's that's probably the the same fears and the same thing that stops people from making a change if they're in whatever corporate career that um, perhaps they've either discovered they're unhappy with. I know, I mean, I spent 27 years in the corporate world, 25 right. of those I really enjoyed. It took me two years to realize that, you know, the reason I was stressed and not enjoying it anymore was because um, things had changed and this was no longer in, in keeping with my core values. Yeah. And, and to get over that fear of trying something new and the fear of uh, failure really um, and, and leaving that path of certainty was a big thing. It is. And when you say the fear of failure, fear of rejection, some people won't even admit it, whether they're lawyers or not. And, and let's expand the discussion, right? We don't need to talk about lawyers. We can talk about business people, MBAs. We can talk really about, about anyone. And we can talk about companies companies that are afraid to to expand and so on. Um, and so when you think about what really is that fear, some some movies come up for me. The I'm dating myself, but The Truman Show from the 90s with Jim Carrey, he had that fear of water that was programmed mm. into him. And I'm giving away the ending, but he finally pops out of the hatch of his studio and realizes the life out there. You've got you know Keanu Reeves, Neo in The Matrix, where all of a sudden he sees the ones and zeros and he's able to stop the bullets. And so... I, I think that for everyone listening who's who's blocked, you're procrastinating, you're putting off the the big thing, you want to start your own business, or maybe even you just want to you want to start a new habit, you want to start running in the morning, you want to do whatever. There's a blocker that's getting in your way, a fear. It happens to me every day, and the best way to overcome or mitigate that fear, that blocker, that obstacle is to shine a light on it is to look at it, is to give it a name. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a, a lawyer who just talked to you last week and she was worried about her client and her client would sue her and just this whole big mess. And what it really came down to is she's about to leave the law, which is beautiful, great thing. She's done, burnt out. She has a severe disappointment of telling her, her client for many years that she's leaving her. Hmm. And She's about to start a new life. And what's holding her back is literally disappointing someone. So we went through this exercise. We called it Debbie Disappointment. And we <laughs> gave it a name. We personified it. And we literally went through. It was a little weird, but it just was this weight off where, we, where she said, she said, look, disappointment has, I, I've, throughout my life, I haven't wanted to disappoint people. And that actually is a strength, right? I mean, mm. if you disappoint your parents or your teachers younger, you're going to, when you're younger, you're going to get grounded. You're going to get an F. You're going to, you know, get sent to the back of class. Like it actually helps you survive to disappoint people. But she's 45 years old. And we literally said, hey, Debbie, disappointment, you helped me survive my years. You help me navigate the world. I'm good now. I don't need you anymore. I'm strong mm. enough. And so Debbie, go away. No offense, but I just, I can't. And it was this release she had and she went, talked to her client and everything's fine, of course. All her fears were unfounded. But it's those type of irrational fears that make a total, total sense. But when you shine a light on them, even funny, give them a name, have a talk to them, you, you, that's the first step in really just letting them go and moving on. And when you let them go, you see the ones and zeros. You see the matrix. Mm. You see the door open. All of a sudden, opportunities present themselves. I don't know if that made sense, and I went on a riff there, but uh, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, yeah, okay. That's a great story. Makes absolute sense. And what I love about it, I mean, it's it's a really good way because we we have this, um, you know, we have these things that are holding us back, and they're part of our, our identity, so we hold on to them. So the moment we can remove them from our identity so giving giving it a name and okay now it's all of a sudden it's it's got its own identity so it doesn't have to be part of my identity and so you can let go of it and the idea of of not saying this is a bad thing 
In fact, it's been a good thing up to now, but it doesn't serve me any longer. So gratitude gave me disappointment for keeping me safe all this time, but now I'm good. Yeah. You're going to want you brought up a fantastic point, which is identity. What if you got rid of your identity? Right? Like we hold on to our identity. So you said, you know, get, get this out of my identity. The next step would be, what if I shift identities? Now I'm not saying, you know, take someone's wallet and their driver's license and redo your name, you know, uh, Don Draper out of Mad Men. I'm not saying mm. that, but what I am saying is, you know, my identity, right? Jewish kid, West Coast, California, perfectionist, got to be smart. Like, really? Do I need that identity? Do I, do, I, do I need all of that? Do I need some of that? And so I think I, I love that you brought up the idea of identity, shifting that identity and getting rid of things that aren't beneficial to you anymore, um, whether taking on a whole new identity, meaning I don't need to be a perfectionist anymore. I can fail sometimes, and that's okay. Identity is really just a story, and it, that can be great. It can give us motivation and aspiration and uh, a sense of community. It can also really trap us and weigh us down. I am a perfectionist. I always get things right. I am the smartest person in the room. You know, if I, Casey, am keep telling myself that story, sure, that may help me succeed and be ambitious and, and get things. At the same time, it may wear out its welcome. I mean, being a perfectionist forever is tiring. I'm burned. I'm sick of it, right? So I just really, I'm really happy you brought that up. And I, I just encourage everyone to sort of look inward and, and understand what your story is, what your narrative is, and um, which I'm using interchangeably here, even though they're a little bit different, but uh, what that story is and really pluck out the things that are beneficial for you, but then also really put a spotlight on the things that aren't beneficial, that may weigh you down and, and really make a call. Uh, if there's some things you can shed. Hmm. Yeah, the, the power of self-awareness there is really important. You talked about, you know, early on, um, knowing yourself and how, how you kind of went through that journey yourself. And and in the example, you know, um, maybe starting a habit. And I know last year um, when the pandemic um, started, uh, when all the lockdowns started as, as a result of the pandemic and, and I'm a keen cyclist. So I go out cycling with a bunch of buddies every morning and in the strictest part of the lockdown, we, we weren't allowed to go out with anyone. So it was sort of solo. And then um, yeah. during winter, I thought, well, you know, it's too cold. And so at some point I started, um, you know, I really fell off the wagon in terms of exercises, exercise, and and I found myself saying I'm lazy, and I thought, yeah. hang on, that's yeah. that's become part of my identity, and it's as simple as making a language, just changing the language a little bit. And I said, well, I'm feeling lazy today. I'm I'm feeling I'm not feeling motivated to go out cycling, and and that enabled me to then say, well, just get up out of bed. Just put on your bike clothes, you know, and then and then take one step after the an, another. And now I'm sort of back cycling regularly simply yeah. by just changing that language. And, and that allowed me to say, well, it's not part of my identity to be lazy. In fact, quite the opposite. It is part of my identity to go out and cycle all I, the time. It's a label. It's a great example. Hmm. Yeah. I had a... For, for for many years, I think I associated the, particularly here in Silicon Valley, entrepreneur. I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I labeled myself an entrepreneur and I wasn't achieving the level of entrepreneur I wanted. And you see in the headlines, all these entrepreneurs doing all this big stuff. And here I am still shooting videos for my Leave Law Behind course. And so I, unbeknownst to me, I shifted away from this label of entrepreneur, which I don't even really know what it means. And it was very just difficult and amorphous. And I moved into just this zone of getting work done, of just enjoying it, of just providing value. And when I freed myself of this identity of having to be an entrepreneur, it, it opened things up for me. It, it was, it was liberating. Hmm. Hmm. It's, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Again, it's, it's, partly just language isn't it but then being focused on here's what i can do this this adds value specifically and um you know and and by doing that 
you could probably be classed as an entrepreneur, but that's that's not the objective. And my business only got more successful once I dropped the label. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, now let's come back to the idea of the self awareness, um, and I'd like to get your views and your tips on how can people who who are looking to make a change in some ways, or maybe even just to clarify their story that they put out there as part of their their you know talking to other people about what they do how can they really understand what they're really good at and what what skills they have and and if they're looking to make a change what are the skills that are transferable into some other area and what areas might that be great yeah great question so I'll give some real details. I'll tell you how we do it in the Leave Law Behind course. So if anyone's interested, take a pen and paper out, take a take a few notes. I'll, I'll give you the exact language we use. The first thing is to create a vision statement of a certain kind. Now, I know companies do it, but create some sort of, of what your why is. And you probably heard that that term before. But, you know, for example, Leave Law Behind, our vision is that, you know, we envision or uh, uh, we're on, Leave Law Behind is on this earth to help unhappy, burned out attorneys realize there's a better way. And that really drives me. There's a better way. You don't need to be anxious. You don't need to be sad. I spoke with a woman today who just joined our program and she is suffering from heart palpitations and from stress and headaches. The work is boring. She feels trapped. You don't need to live that way. So that's leave law behind vision statement now. And that's where I see leave law behind going. And so you can do it for yourself. You know, your your vision is, you know, I, I I envision a world where I work, where work and play are one in the same, and I'm time independent, and I am able to provide for myself without a job. Whatever, right? You could you could whether you're entrepreneurial or I can see myself becoming a leader in the corporate world doing X Y Z. What whatever it is. So a vision statement is great. And then you understand, okay, well, then how the heck am I going to do it? And a lot of the pain and suffering with it, why and why there's so much job dissatisfaction in the world, and particularly here in America when I see the statistics, is there's a disconnect between your skills and strengths and what the job description calls for. Job description, first of all, aren't written that well, and they're kind of loosey-goosey. A lot of the jobs actually that Leave Law Behind members find are sort of through a second flank, if you will. We They're not even published jobs or they get introductions and you're able to find a job that you really, really love. But it's that disconnect. So if you are a people person and you're a collaborator and you love to create things and you're now in a law job where it's very adversarial and you work on your own, you're not going to be happy, Right. Um, the same thing if you're in, uh, let's say you love research and you love creating things and writing things and just being behind the scenes and now you're in sales or an account director, you're not, you're not going to be happy. You, you could kind of cross industry. So the first step is really understanding not, people say, well, what job should I go to? And I say, don't go there yet. Don't focus on the job yet as much as you want to. Let's look inward. And for the first time or one of the first times, focus on yourself. What are your skills and strengths? And if for any sports fans out there, I'm a big sports fan, it's like a scouting report of an athlete. What is this athlete good? Now, Steph Curry, basketball, my warriors here in the, in the Bay Area, I mean, he, you know what he does well. He shoots from 30 feet. He shoots three-pointers. He's very quick, handles the ball. If you had him rebound under the basket and do what the seven-footers need to do, he wouldn't do that well. It's a mismatch, right? Hmm. That makes sense when we think about celebrities or sports stars. But for some reason, so many of us are in a job that's a mismatch. So there's three questions that we ask. And the first one is, I ask this of your network, uh, friends and family, people you trust. You want to gather all of these traits. The first one is, what do I do well? Compliment me. Even if it's just you're good at planning parties or you're good at speaking or you put the IKEA tables together well, whatever it is. The second one is, what advice do you come to me for? And the third one is, what have I done or what do I do for free? And gather it from people that, you're, that will be open to this, that have known you a long time, that, knew, that met you last week, whatever it is. You gather all of these traits. You bring them together. Um, and leave all behind, we, we help segment them and bucket them. But then you kind of organize them into areas like 
interpersonal skills, leadership skills, behind the scenes skills, keep the trains running on time skills, creative skills, however you want to bucket it. And that then begins the path where you create your story. You see what bubbles up and you say, oh my God, I used to think I was uh, kind of an interpersonal schmoozer, but everyone is telling me and I have to agree, I'm kind of a behind the scenes air traffic control person who loves to be quiet, but be the master behind the scenes. I love process. Okay, great. Do you like that? Yeah, I love it. Let's go look at logistics. Let's go look at vendor management. Let's go look at supply chain. Let's go look at project management, right? Once you kind of get that narrative that's really based on your true skills and traits, then it's easy. We just match jobs to it and, and you get out there. So I'll, I'll pause there, but hopefully I want to give some real, real advice of steps that people could take to really create this narrative, which ultimately translates into a resume and gives direction as to which jobs they should apply to. Mm, yeah, I love it. And, and those questions are, are magic too. The, um, I mean, it reminds me um, of you know our process for marketing, and it's whether it's you know you, you're marketing a personal brand or you're marketing a, a business, starts off with that self awareness. So, what are we good at? What do we do well? Why are we in this business, and why are we doing what we do? And and then from there, you can craft a story that you tell people, and and you tell it to the people who are a good fit people who it might resonate with the people who you might be able to help so this is like the analogy of that you know you you then have craft that story that you can then go and match it with the jobs that are a good fit yeah. and to go back to the beginning the fears leave law behind people will go into an interview and the people will say things like yeah i really see it you know you're a lawyer you don't have experience here but wow, these nine things kind of nailed it. And you're smart and you're this. And the, the leave all behind member, the lawyer is thinking to themselves, are you joking me? Really? You think I'm a fit for this? Like, you know, um, but they believe it and, and, and get there. And, and that's really where it is, is that you become a fit. Again, you don't even need to be 100%. Many people are getting jobs that are 70% a fit because many of these of these jobs, they want to train you, or they it's a wish list. The job description is a wish list. They don't need all 100% filled. 70% is 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 fine, right? Depending on on the company. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I love the process. Um, so the um, the power of storytelling. Um, so you said that was one of your big skills, and you love telling stories. So why is it so important? to kind of think of a lot of the messages that we put out there in terms of storytelling. So, and I'm just, I'm trying to get better at it. There are so many phenomenal storytellers out there that I, that I love and, and listen to and, and model after, but ultimately, whether it's a customer, whether it's a client, a stakeholder, whether it's your, your children, whoever it is in your life, we're, we're always selling. Uh, it could be to get something we want. It could be selfish, zero sum game. Hopefully not. Hopefully you're doing something that's beneficial to, to, to most people. So to, to both people, both parties. So let's assume that's the, that's the case. But I have found that to, for, to get people to act, to persuade them to move, to get them going, to motivate them, they need oftentimes need to come to it at their own conclusion or need to see it modeled. Uh, they can't just be told to do it. And so in lieu of them being with a company that does this or being around you 24 seven to see you model it, because I could take a long time, a story is oftentimes the best way to model it for people, whether it's a client looking to, looking to grow and have a go to market strategy or whether it's um, your your children or whether it's uh, someone that you're motivating through coaching or consulting. And a story is is way that just sort of viscerally lets them see it. Um, I, I think that we, we think so intellectually and, and we've been programmed. The philosopher Alan Watts talks about how we've been really programmed with kind of a, a spotlight mentality that we focus on one thing productivity. I'm going to zero in on this. I'm going to get this done. There are so many productivity tools that help you 
do a very minute thing, which I get it needs to be done. I think what he says, and, and he's seen this in Hinduism and Buddhism, Buddhism, is that they come from kind of a more floodlight philosophy, where this is, again, where Keanu saw the ones and zero, where Neo saw the ones and zeros in the Matrix, where you sort of see things that you can't see when you have a spotlight. You see it when you have a floodlight. And it's that level of consciousness and awareness that I, I know I don't have regularly. I'm trying to. But I think that's something that, that I aspire to. And I think if more people were able to kind of branch out and, and move beyond just this kind of focused element, um, it won't make us lazy. It won't make us un more unproductive. I think in many ways, it'll actually open us up to so many other opportunities and, and ease in many ways. Mm, yeah, I love it. The, um, it. It comes back to this idea of self-awareness as well. And it um, reminded me of our conversation around fears earlier, because I'd um, my business coach has this metaphor, and it's around the fears, and we fo you know we focus on the fears, and this is going to happen. And she says, well, if you go into a, a dark room with a torch and you shine the torch into a corner, and there in that corner is this big hairy spider, and you're really scared of spiders, um, and yet every other corner is filled with gold. And yet, because you're only shining the torch on that spider, that's, that's all right. you see. That's right. That's all you see. Yeah, it's a spotlight. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. And, I, you know, I get where the spotlight came from. From a consciousness level, we go back 70,000 years to our ancestors, Neanderthals. Um, if you have a spot, you need a spotlight because if there's rustling in the bushes, hmm. the ones who survive are the ones that hear it and run away. And the saber-toothed tiger doesn't, doesn't eat them. I get it. But just like Debbie Disappointment, there are no more saber-toothed tigers, for better or for worse, right? We've, we've, we've got civilization. We have concrete streets. And so, but, and so we're okay. We can lock our doors, but we still have that, what they call the lizard brain. We still have that spotlight. We're all sort of listening for the proverbial rustling of the bushes. And most often not, it's, it's, it's not there, but our consciousness remains in that way. So. Hmm. Yeah, love it. All right, well, this is fascinating, Casey. Um, we could continue this conversation for ages, but I am aware of the time. I want to be respectful of your time, so I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. Yeah, and it's designed to help our audience, who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field, with some tips from your experience. So, I have five questions. Hopefully, you'll give us some really insightful answers and inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result. Today. Yeah. I hope so. I'll do my best. <laughs> Great. What do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Empathy. Hmm. I think you need to be empathetic. And empathetic is not just being sympathetic. Hey, I, I feel you. You know, I'm sorry. But it's as much as possible being in their shoes, understanding. Customers, people, we all just want to be understood. And oftentimes, we're, we're projecting meaning onto things. There's an illusion here, if you will. We, we, someone reacts a certain way. We, we project a meaning onto that person. Oh, they're disappointed in me. Who knows? Maybe they just they had a sniffle. Like, it's got nothing to do with you, right? So I think if you, if you have empathy towards fill in the blank, your customer, the, the audience, the problem you're trying to solve as an entrepreneur, the the issue within your organization whatever the whatever that case may be one it greases the rails if you will it makes it a lot easier to get things done because you get you can rally people and they feel understood and they're not obstacles but from an innovation standpoint which is really just something new you and we can get into that definition more if you'd like the idea of empathy i think really triggers a whole new way of thinking. And for me, a whole new way of thinking is is really the bedrock of what innovation is. So I would I would start with empathy. Mm, yeah, I love it. And you said something there that I think is a really important part of that, and that's avoid projecting meaning onto things. 
And I think we all do that. And it's probably part of that, you know, being afraid of the saber toothed tiger, the rustling in the bushes must be a saber toothed tiger. Right. Right. And yet, um, for me, I mean, I do it all the time, but when I catch myself doing it, I think, well, what else could it be? What else could it mean? And that opens up a lot of possibilities and, and also allows conversation to happen which i think is an important part of empathy yeah. well i i'll give you an example with leave law behind in the early days when i started the program i had a sales page all the online marketing stuff and i wasn't getting any sales or not not as many a few years ago not many as i wanted i of course took it personally i'm a failure my course is horrible my sales page is horrible all of that the more I learned was maybe, who knows, you know, maybe some people just didn't like me, but really what it came down to was the fear. They were so afraid. Hmm. Like they couldn't even, are you kidding me? I'm this guy, Casey, I'm going to join this guy. He's living the life. He's so great. I mean, who knows what they thought of me, but it wasn't, they thought I was a failure. They thought they, they were a failure. Hmm. And once I had the empathy to really understand where they were coming from and just not make me the center of the world and it all about me, I was able to change my messaging. I was able to focus on how these fears are things they can overcome. Uh, and we're still working on it, but it really, that empathy enabled, really trickled down into my marketing, into how I improved the product, into how I improved my coaching when I met one-on-one people. Um, it changed my whole perspective on, on things that I needed to touch base with folks on um, because really when I wasn't connecting with them on this issue, I literally was not understanding them. Uh, and it helped me understand them more. And if, if understanding your customer is really what this is all about, um, mm. that's an example of where it just, it really propelled me. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I, um, great story. Uh, we, we use a tool. I I'm really love this tool in terms of uh, how to, get a deeper understanding at an empathetical level with clients and it's it's called the empathy map and you can use it for all kinds of different things um, but it um, it really is a great way to analyze um, the beliefs behaviors and um, desires of others in a way that you know you can articulate it and then test the assumptions that that come up when you do mm-hmm. that exercise by talking to people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Empathy map. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? So a, a few things. One is I, I read a lot, but I, I don't want to sound that like, haha, I'm reading more books than you are. I don't mean that. I mean, <laughs> I read various things, whether it's emails, whether it's a podcast, whether it's it's uh, bloggers, you know, that that come into my inbox, all of that. But I'm I particularly like the self development space. I particularly like, you know, if you think of Simon Sinek or or Mark Manson or uh, Penelope Trunk. Some of these are well known, others are not. Um, there's a lot of people writing, and they just have fantastic ideas. Some of it's regurgitated and it's the same old stuff. Some of it is the same old stuff, but packaged in a way that resonates mm. with me. And some of it is, is just really great new ideas. And so they've really helped me. And so, for example, Mark Manson just recently wrote about this idea called Above and Below the API in an email post. And this was written by Peter Reinhardt, who is the CEO of Segment, which was bought by Twilio back in 2015. And it's all mm. about how automation and humans and how uh, jobs, and it really provided a framework to look at was your job below or above essentially the automation waterline, if you will, blew my mind. And I've been able to take that and use that as a framework within business. So it's little nuggets like that. So I think the first thing is read books and whatever you're into, but there are so many new ideas coming. And I would encourage people to go to not you know, maybe not the Tony Robbins of the world or, or Gary V or people like that, like really find people who are well known, but are, are at the at a less uh, on the radar level. The, the second thing I do is I go alone. I just I take my dog. I go for a walk. We go for a jog at 10 p.m. at night and 
just get out and I think, and I just, I just let my mind wander. You need the, the sort of walking in the garden with your hands behind your back. And I take a pen and paper, or I take my phone and write down notes, or I'll do an audio, but really just, you got to take that time to let your mind water, wander. It's almost meditative. Get away from the screen. Hmm. Um, I know it sounds counterintuitive. You're saying just go for a walk will actually make me more productive and it will. The ideas will come. You'll you'll really start thinking. And then the other thing is uh, having opportunities to really brainstorm with people um, that you feel open and honest with. You mentioned Oleg, um, Scott Mason, our other folks, a friend of ours. That you know, you really just throw ideas. You feel vulnerable with them. Uh, you can you can connect. So really, one reads, gathering ideas. There's all these new concepts and ideas out there that you can interpret. To uh, get out, just go for a walk. Just get out and let the mind wander. And then three, have a good group of confident uh, of people, confidants that you can be vulnerable in, uh, vulnerable with, and and share the ideas. Those are kind of the three main ways that that things sort of percolate for me. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating, and uh, it's interesting. I I did come across. Um, it must be getting a lot more airtime again now. The above and below the API. Um, you idea. heard it too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's I. It's. I must have had at least two emails um, that people referred to it. And I thought I must go and revisit that because it kind of rang a bell with me, but I can't recall all the details. Yeah. Mm. And ironically, if you Google it, there aren't, there isn't much being written about it. There'll probably be more coming out. And there was a futurist, I forget his name. He wrote about it on, on one of his, I forget who he was. He's former Google or something. He wrote a very long article, but interesting article. Or, or, oh, there's another, uh, Premium mediocre, I think it was his term. Premium mediocre. So a similar idea. But you know, you get these ideas from these from these bloggers or futurists or someone who's done a TEDx talk, and some of them, you know, don't help. But uh, but yeah, they they start coming up. So hmm. yeah, and the idea of um, taking time for yourself and going away and enjoying something away from screen and um, you know the counterintuitive nature of I've got all this work I need to do. I mean, I find that quite often that if I if I'm under pressure and under stress and I've got all this stuff I really need to finish and I'm struggling a little bit to move it forward if I go and take uh, often I'll go for a walk or go for a bike ride and take an hour off um, I'll yeah. come back and I'll be so much more productive so it, it actually uh, allows me to do something I enjoy clears my mind and exactly. and I come back and it kind of breaks the that barrier i think it was thomas aquinas like I, he was in the 13 1400s a catholic catholic theologian or gandhi i forget maybe they both said it but they both said something along the lines of i've got a 12 hour work day ahead of me i need to meditate for four hours mm. which which doesn't like are you kidding why would you do that why don't you dive into your work but the whole point was they need to gear up they they need to tap into the zone they need to tap into their inner source to, to really take care of, of what they need to get done. And, and the irony of that, the counterintuitive nature of it really struck me. So, yeah. Okay. Now, do you have a favorite resource you use most often? You talked about people and brainstorming with people. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like a Luddite here, but literally <laughs> a, a Google doc, uh, get my ideas out. Uh, mm. I really, I, I'm just about, getting the ideas out in some form or another. And then from there, I then determine what the, the next stage is. I'm, I'm sort of a, a fan of steps. And so put it into a sheet, put it into slides, put it into a flow chart. Uh, you can take it from there. But the problem I've had a lot is I will jump ahead into the medium of delivering something. So I'll, if I want to get an idea to present something, I'll jump into slides. But that's for presenting. That's not for ideation, mm. right? And I get stuck. Like, here I am, the four corners of the slide, and do I create a circle or an image? I'm not even there yet. I'm ahead of the game, right? Uh, and so for me, um, just really getting my thoughts out works. I think once you get to that point, um, having just a project plan, uh, and I'm not the best at it, but having some sort of project plan with dependencies, whether it's a smart sheets or one of these other tools that reminds you um, or even even an Excel sheet. I think the other thing is the reminders. 
Uh, I'm very bad at reminding myself if I put it on my to-do list, but some sort of automatic reminder. I can't tell you how many times my my bell has come up and I've said, oh my God, thank you so much for, for ringing me. Otherwise I wouldn't have done X, Y, Z. So th- those are those are sort of the, I'm bar- embarrassed to say, not the most advanced things, but but they help me. Hmm. Yeah, well, the, the reminders is actually quite powerful, particularly if you start to build up a big list of things to do or right. um, you know, your calendar starts to fill up pretty quickly. So I, I, um, reminders are really important for me as well. Exactly. And also you can relax because there's one less thing you have to try and keep in your mind. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Hmm. All right, now what's the best way to keep a client on track? think the best way, so reminders, accountable, uh, following up, which means you may need to remind yourself to remind them. Yeah. So keeping yourself on track so so you can keep them on track. And the other thing are clear clear directions. So the mistakes I've made sometimes have been, well, we'll just go do it, or what I thought were clear directions. And it wastes time because they do something else or they don't do exactly what I wanted them to do, and then when we get on the phone, they don't have it prepped, and now we now we're not where we need to be. So uh, for me, it's it's keeping myself on track to keep them on track, and the reminders, and then also giving the the clear directions. So, hmm. yeah, I love the love the idea of keeping ourselves on track first, and yeah. because the clients, if if it's a really good client, then we're in rapport and whatever is whatever their response is likely to be triggered by what you've been doing and with automation now you can do obviously you can do that personally with sending an email phone call whatever the case may be but we've set up at leave law behind timing sequences with emails we have text uh there's things along those lines which also Mm. serve to help keep them on track based on the progress they're making so yeah all right. And uh, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Be themselves. <laughs> be themselves. And if you're trying to be someone else or differentiate, I get it. It makes sense. But there are people that want to resonate with you. And there are so many people in the world. The, the, the TAM, the total addressable market, I mean, you've got enough, right? There's enough raving fans out there. They want to connect with you. Whatever logic we think when it comes to selling or joining, it's pretty much all emotional, really, when you think about it. And so they want to connect with you. I was um, talking with a a client today who's an online coach um, in the fitness space, and he was talking about how the the difference between him and some online fitness coaches is the fitness coaches would do a workout. Here's the workout. Here's what you do. He would um, talk and talk about his family. Obviously, he would do the workouts too. People just loved him, like he's a human. Mm. And he wouldn't talk for hours, but he would tell a story. Here I am, and my daughter. Okay, let's dive into the workout. But people just said, I love this guy. He's a human. I also really thought that was funny. It's a good story. Okay, now let's do our workout. And it just totally differentiated him, but it was easy for him because he was just being himself. And so Mm. whether it's your product or your company, this is why, like we said, the vision statement is so important. Why those unique genius questions, what am I good at? What advice do you come to me for? And what have I done or what do I do for free are all very important because it really gets at your core, if you will, value proposition, what you're good at, how you provide value. Um, and not that you just phone it in from the couch, but it's something that comes naturally to you. And you still have to work at it, but it's not, it's not too much work. And so to differentiate yourself, I really think, ironically, just be yourself. Now, work at it, hone it, refine it, see what works, what doesn't. But that that would be my my two cents. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And I love the examples, too. The And, and you mentioned something there that I, I keep um, reminding people of also when when we talk about this and we talk about just be yourself is to put on a mask and and you know often in the corporate world we do that um, we kind of separate the the private and we separate some of our personality into the corporate yeah. world because there's an expectation or we believe there's an expectation somebody else has an expectation of how we need to be in this role 
And that is very draining. It's yeah, hard really. work. Whereas if you be yourself, it's kind of natural because you know, you're doing that all the time without expending right. much energy at all. Now, someone may say, wait, Casey, just 30 minutes ago, you said, get rid of your identity, try and be a new identity, right? You're right. Maybe being yourself is showing how you're evolving yourself and how you're maturing mm -hmm. and how you're yeah. choosing. You know, an interesting, ironic story is the word person comes from the Greek persona. And persona was the mask that had that megaphone type mouth area that the Greek actors wore in ancient Greece to in the place. And they had the megaphone so, to, so their voices could carry. When we say we're an authentic, be a real person, authentic person, we're literally saying be phony. Because you're literally a person is putting on a mask, right? Yeah. Um, so we don't need to take it too far, but, but realize that all of us have a mask on. We have a facade. And when you mm. say be a real person, um, we're, we're sort of <laughs> taking, we're, we're not really hewing to the real, the real meaning of it. What that does, though, is it really gives us liberty to, I'm not saying be a chameleon so no one can pin you down, but I am saying that understand that it's fluid. There's, no, there's nothing that needs to be rigid. If you're rigid and staying in place, that's almost a recipe for decay. But if you're fluid and changing in an authentic, sincere way and, and really having that self-critical awareness, um, I have found that's the, the recipe for growth. I mean, as I realized with Leave Law Behind, I had certain rigidity about it needs to be this way. Once I was able to kind of let go of some of those, my business grew and mm. the proof is in the pudding there. So um, that is one thing that I would that I would say is be yourself, but also realize that yourself can be fluid. That's right. Yeah. And, and part of being authentic, I think, is, you know, I mean, it, this takes a little bit of courage, but to talk about here's, here's some of the things I've learned over the past week or month or whatever it might be. And here's some things I want to try out. Um, and it may be, you know, I'm going to let go of Debbie. Disappointment. Debbie, what was it? Disappointment. <laughs> I was going to say doubt, but yeah, disappointment. Yeah. It's just same, stronger. yeah. Um, I'm yeah. going to let go of her and turn over a new leaf and um, embrace some more confidence or whatever it might be. So, exactly. Hmm. Exactly. All right. Well, this has been fabulous, Casey. Now, where can people find out more about you, find out about Leave Law Behind and the other work you're doing, and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? I would love to hear from folks. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Casey Berman, C-A-S-E-Y, B-E-R-M-A-N. I'm connected with, with Jurgen, so uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. You'll see my picture there, um, San Francisco. And uh, also Leave Law Behind leave law behind.com uh find me there you can contact us through the website or email me directly casey c-a-s-e-y at leave law behind.com great and we'll include those links in the show notes i love it now do you have some parting advice today for our listener well parting advice you know the i would say this if if you're struggling, if you're in a down position of some kind, your your whatever the case may be, um, business isn't taking off, or you're just not meeting the expectations that you have. I heard a quote that said, "A miracle is really just a change in perspective." So, and and an expectation is really something we impose, and in that delta, that difference between what we are thinking. And what we expect is really the, the cause of suffering, as, as, the, as the Buddha said himself. But I would really say, how can I view this in a different perspective? Um, hmm. And that means that it doesn't mean your business is failing or that you're not able to do X, Y, Z. But what it really means is that you're just on your path. Um, you're building it. I think one other thing is to also realize there is a better way. There's just always a better way. And hmm. so... Uh, I want anyone who's, who's sort of glass half empty to, to think of it that way. And I'm happy to flesh that out more with anyone if they want to chat. For the folks that, that are in the zone, that are feeling great, that things are humming for you, um, celebrate it. Embrace it. And I think 
also take a step back and observe it. And what I've realized is when things are going really well for me, the more I realize it's not me, it's not personal, it's something kind of coming through me. For example, Leave Law Behind, I don't even remember creating all of the content. It kind of just came out of me. <laughs> um, you know, taking that step back and to do that, and I'm not saying to do that just to be humble, but what that does then is it enables you to kind of have a flood-like consciousness of, well, what else can come out of me? I think I have fallen in the trap of leave all behind. This is it. This is my business. This is what I'm going to do. And literally, I'm kind of excluding myself from other stuff I could do or other people that I could meet. So if you're down in the dumps or if you're in the zone having a great day, those are the two things that, that I would recommend, which both kind of come down to um, kind of changing uh, your perspective on whatever situation you're in. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I love the power of reframing things or uh, changing perspective, particularly if, um, you know, if something's not going according to plan or the way you desire it. And, and my favorite uh, time I do that is if I'm on the bike and it's sort of back to some bike stories, if I'm on the bike uh, going up this big hill and it's really hurting and I'm struggling and, you know, I know there's another 10 kilometers of climbing to yeah. go and it's only going to get steeper from here. And if I focus on that, it becomes really hard. And, and if I instead focus on the surroundings, the beautiful countryside that I'm in, the beautiful views that I'm getting because I'm climbing higher and higher and just focus on my breathing and forget the rest of it then before i know it i'm at the top of the mountain and it didn't seem that hard after all um, exactly. so that that's my favorite sort of you know metaphor for for reframing when things are yeah. are not going as you might think and i like the idea also of well first of all the celebrations i mean we we kind of achieve goals all the time and then we okay what's next we not take the time to celebrate and also to separate it from ourselves as well so that we can analyze the process. You know, how can I repeat that process that got me that success? I'm, I'm so guilty of not celebrating progress. I'm just mm. so guilty of it. I, I, give, I do do gratitude. I say thank you. I try as much as I can, but I get into that, well, got to get this done. Um, but then also just the little things, the progress I've made, uh, that is something. Thank you for reminding me. That's something I need to need, should. I don't want to say those words, but it's really something I want to do to do more of. Hmm, great. All right. Well, we can celebrate this, uh, yeah. this podcast episode now. But before we wrap up, uh, who else should I get on the show and why? Yeah. Who else should you get on the show and why? Um, it's That's a great question. So, do you know um do you know Scott Mason who's Oh yeah I've me had, and have you had Scott? Had on? Scott you know Scott. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. He's a great guy. I'd love to have yeah. him back on. <laughs> yeah, you should have him back on. Um yeah. let me see who should you have on the show? Um let me I'm blanking. Um there's so many people that I'm uh We'll follow up with you after the show, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Let me. I'm trying to think. It would be. Hold on one moment. Um. Yeah. Let me get back to you on that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we'll we'll yep. touch base with Scott because I I talk to Scott from time to time. So yeah. Um, we'll touch base with him and see whether we can. I'm sure we'll find a topic we can uh, riff on in another podcast. Exactly. Episode. Yeah. Exactly. Good. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today, Casey. I've had a lot of fun having this conversation. I think there's a lot to learn for people even outside of the law profession around mindset and changes. And if they're in a, a situation where perhaps they're unhappy, how they might be able to um do the self-analysis work and and the self aware and develop the self-awareness where they can then say, well, these are all the skills I have and right. perhaps that could be used in other areas. So thanks for that and exactly. all the best for the future and let's stay in touch. 
Thank you. No, absolutely. I love it. This, it's so great what you're doing. It's definitely testament with with how long you've been been doing this. The conversations are great, and I just love how you're kind of overlapping with innovation and business and what needs to get done with mindset and and really kind of digging deep into into what really drives all of this. So uh, it's been an honor to be here. I loved it. I had a great time. Thanks, guys. I hope you really enjoyed and got value from that insightful and really engaging conversation with Casey and took something away from what he shared with us today. I particularly liked Casey's process for identifying your unique genius and his three magic questions to ask of yourself and also of others. I'd love to know what you took away from Casey's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Casey Berman. That is C-A-S-E-Y-B-E-R-M-A-N, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Casey Berman. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Casey, as well as links to the Leave Law Behind website to Casey's social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Now, if you liked and got value from this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with at least two other people so that we can get this wonderful information out into the hands of people that it might help. Tag me in on that share and I'll reward you with a special surprise. Casey suggested that we have a conversation with speaker, podcast host and consultant Scott Mason on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. Now, Scott has been on the show before on episode 381 of the Innova Buzz podcast, and it will be awesome to have him back on the show for another highly engaging and meaningful conversation. So, Scott, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Casey Berman. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including Eric Seropian of This Is My South Bay and Jeff Harry of Rediscover Your Play. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.